Hello and welcome to Cost Accounting. I am your host, Dr. B. Happy to have you with us today as we explore the concept of data analytics. Today we're going to talk about how data analytics provides opportunities and challenges for cost accounting and what that looks like. First, we need to understand what data is and how data is structured and unstructured. So first, let's talk about big data. Big data is structured and unstructured data that's obtained from a variety of sources and volumes that are large for traditional technologies to capture, manage, and process. Typically, when we talk about big data, we're talking about massive spreadsheets and workbooks that are very, very large in nature. Structured data uses predefined formats and organized in a very logical way using rows and columns within fixed fields. These are typically added to databases and easy to manipulate and use. In thinking about an Excel spreadsheet, that is a form of structured data. At the top of the Excel spreadsheet, in the, in the first row, you have identified uh, the, in the rows and columns that you have identified fields. And then you can sort and organize and clean and manipulate that data. That is considered structured data. Unstructured data is free form without definition. Things like images and voice messages. That type of data is expensive to manipulate in broadly usable formats. When I think about unstructured data, I think about things like a telephone call. A telephone call is unstructured data. It uses the voice data that's going across the lines in an incoherent way that's difficult to manipulate. Other forms of unstructured data would include things like a signal being sent across wires for an internet broadcast. Unstructured data would also include things like a YouTube video. It's difficult to manipulate that type of data. So that we would consider a, something like YouTube video to be unstructured data. So what do we do with all of this data, especially in cost accounting? One of the things that we need to do is analyze that data and the analysis of data is truly an art and a science together. The data analytics emphasizes the data and the analysis to organize and present that information in a logical way to traditional business users that may not quite understand how data analytics works. In other words, we take large sets of data, we clean it, organize it, analyze it, and then present it in a logical way. And that logical way might be in the form of a PowerPoint presentation or a dashboard that you developed in Power BI or in Excel. And so, the user, the end user, the business user, can manipulate the data in a very easy to understand way. So of course, this enables the ability to look deeper into the information and to make decisions ultimately. So with data and data analytics, there's a lot of challenges and opportunities that we face. Some of the challenges are things like, what information do we need in order to define a business problem? Another challenge would be something like, who needs to see this information? And the one of the third challenges would be 
understanding the technical terms that go into data analytics from a business perspective for the decision makers. Oftentimes the decision makers don't quite understand the technological terms. And so what are the opportunities associated with these challenges? Well, one of the first opportunities that we have is accountants have a great understanding of how to communicate clearly to non-accountants in a logical way for them to be able to understand and interpret the data to make decisions. Another opportunity is accountants are comfortable with working with a diversified team of leaders and other decision makers around them. And the third opportunity is accountants have many insights into the company regarding data analytics for strategic decision-making. So as we gather data, where are we gathering it from? And how do we analyze it? Well, first it's important to understand the decision-making framework before gathering information. The first step of the framework is to outline the problem and its related unknowns. The second step is to identify suitable options and gather relevant information for the decision-making process. And of course, in identifying any assumptions. The third step is to calculate the relevant information and costs and benefits for each option. And the fourth step is to select the option that maximizes the benefits and meets the requirements for qualitative criteria. The fifth step is to execute on your decision. From a data analytics and decision-making perspective, after we've sourced our information, we store it in a logical place, like a, a file on a computer or on the cloud. We retrieve the data from that file and we begin manipulating the data. We clean it, we organize it in a logical way. That's what we mean by manipulation. And then we extract the important information in order to gain insights into what we're looking at. The insights help us to tell the story, identify trends, patterns, and relationships within the data. And then of course, those insights help the decision makers to plan for the future and make decisions. What are some sources of the data? Well, of course, we have hard data, which is I verifiable and acquired from reliable sources. An example of hard data would be obtaining a 10K report from the Securities Exchange Commission. The 10K report is verifiable, and it's acquired from a reliable source. Soft data includes qualitative inputs like results, ratings, or surveys. Other examples of soft data will include things like interviews of decision makers. What, so what's the difference between data and information, you might be asking yourself? Well, data is the building block that requires organization, context, and refinement for in order for it to be useful. You take the raw data, we put it into our Excel or Power BI, and we analyze it. 
by organizing it in a meaningful way. We try to draw some inferences from it in order for it to be useful. Information, on the other hand, is already processed data that's already been organized and has a structure and already has a capability of being useful. Of course, there's a lot of different ways of looking at data. Some is internal data and some is external data. Internal data, of course, is the data generated within the company's existing internal processes. Examples of this would include information from suppliers, production and operations, human resources, sales and marketing, customer service, the customers themselves, accounting and finance department, and from information and technology, all found within the company. External data is data found outside of the company. And typically this is of interest for stakeholders uh, and the information is not generated internally. Typically, this type of information includes industry and market information. External data sources are used for uh, the business decision-making. And of course, the data uh, is typically available for purchase, especially industry data. It's available through press releases and other methods of online and traditional news sources, email, or even pen and paper, believe it or not. There are individuals and companies that broker data. It's where there's information that has been obtained from consumers and is made available for purchase and is typically used for marketing purposes. We use data oftentimes to gain insights into our customers to better understand them and their behaviors. The data helps us to develop profiles on our customers. And we can see a wide variety of information about our customers that includes things like personal information, financial data, the, their activity and history, their health and fitness, and their interests. Understanding these different components of information about our customers helps the business to make better decisions about marketing products to those customers and also developing new products based off of the customer's needs. Of course, the focus and approach to finding the right data is asking the right questions. Asking the right questions helps you to obtain the data that you're seeking. The data needs to be able to tell a story, a cohesive understanding of a timeline, and it needs to show a theme. The data should always be forward-looking. The, the history helps to tell the story of the future. The data should be a mix of quantitative and qualitative information. So let's take a look at an example using Google Analytics. Google Analytics tracks and reports organizations' website traffic, tells us the number of unique visitors, the uh, IP addresses of those visitors, the country of origin for those visitors, and sometimes we get you can we can even get demographics of the users of the websites. The reason why all that information will be important to a company is, of course, to 
better market and sell their company's products to those unique visitors to the website. Understanding where your customers are coming from helps the business to better position itself to be able to sell those products and services. So I'm looking at Google Analytics. Through the Google Analytics Academy, we can understand how Google Analytics works. Uh, and this is a great program at no cost to individuals who are interested in un further understanding the analytics within Google uh, to, to understand how traffic is driven and uh, how that information is analyzed. So uh, if you have the opportunity, I strongly encourage you to visit the Google Analytics Academy to, to learn how the tools work. How is data stored? Well, it's stored in a lot of different ways, right? It's stored on a, a physical drive on a computer. It's stored on the cloud, uh, which is, you know, of course, accessible from, from any device. It's stored uh, in, in uh, databases. It's stored in software databases. You name it, right? It's important to understand where that data is being housed in order to retrieve it in the future. Examples of this would be transactions that we record in accounting are oftentimes housed within a software platform like QuickBooks or Sage or Oracle. That software helps us to display that data in a meaningful way. Oftentimes the software is integrated with other software components. For example, QuickBooks might have a link or, or relationship with Salesforce, uh, which helps to manage the customer relationship side of things. And QuickBooks helps to manage the financial side of things. Together, we call these solutions an enter enterprise resource planning system. So there are some off-the-shelf ERPs, and one of those is uh, Oracle. Oracle provides uh, both a customer relationship management and financial management um, in one software package. And looking at how that stored data is used in analytics, the analytics software, such as Power BI or Excel, has the ability to pull that data from uh, the enterprise resource planning systems, and, and it pulls that data out in a meaningful way and is analyzed for the decision-making process. That's what this nice graphic shows us. The data uh, that we store, of course, needs to be very secure. It's typically stored in a structured way uh, and is easily analyzed at a future date. How do the different departments within the company store information? So he here we have uh, a couple of areas within the company and shows us how that data is stored. So if we look at this from an uh, enterprise resource planning system, our customer data includes things like names and addresses and transaction history, products that they've purchased in the past, how they paid for that information, whether they used the discount or not. Uh, and of course, if there were any exchanges or, or uh, returns made. Human resources uses and stores data on employees that include things like their hire date, uh, their demographics, uh, any notations, their area of expertise, and of course, the other important information like their labor rate, that all of the W-4 type of information. 
And then with respect to suppliers, information that we typically store in an ERP would include things like where the vendor is located, what it, what, the, what are the payment terms like 210 net 30, uh, what is the typical transportation arrangement, is it, is it uh, FOB, is it FOB destination or shipping point? Um, and of course, what how often do they supply us on time and what are the overall ratings? These are the type of pieces of information that we would store in an ERP system. The unstructured data that we would store in uh, an ERP system might include things like uh, the variation in temperature within the factory, number of uh, call center uh, calls and recordings, uh, emails that are received, customer comments, uh, even internal mail uh, within the company. All of these are unstructured pieces of data and information that we would store within an ERP in a meaningful way, oftentimes uh, within a, a PDF type of format. What is the cost of data? As a cost accountant, this is something that we think about on a regular basis. Uh, what is the cost of storing data? What is the cost of maintaining that data? Uh, it's difficult to track sometimes uh, to understand what the exact cost of storing data is. It's not just the cost of the hard drives or the um, solid state drives or the cloud storage expense or the, the server room that the company might have. It goes beyond that, right? And so sometimes um, calculating that exact, that exact cost of storing uh, data, it, it can be very challenging. Other things that impact the cost of, of a company having data and storing data are potential violations would include things like the company got hacked and uh, there was a loss of data or there was a virus that got into the computer system and destroyed data or um, other type of malicious acts um, by other individuals or companies. Um, have a serious impact on the cost of, of maintaining data. And so, of course, uh, what do we do to prevent things like that happening? We employ a lot of different uh, methods, uh, antivirus software, uh, various levels of security for accessing the data, uh, two-factor authentication, fingerprint readers, uh, facial recognition software, et cetera. So, so there are a lot of safeguards that you you notice that companies are putting into place uh, to to really safeguard that data, um, because ultimately the cost of data goes beyond just storage. Uh, it also goes in, in into into law, right? Um, especially if there's a proceeding where the company is being sued by their customers or by their vendors or uh, some other external stakeholder because of a violation. Uh, that had occurred or a breach of data. Yeah. So important things to consider when we talk about the cost of data. When it comes to identifying appropriate data, oftentimes we attach things like labels or tags to uh, data sets, and it, it makes it easier for us to pull and uh, combine that type of data in a, in a more meaningful way. Uh, and and so that's why it's it's a it's important that we identify information using things like unique identifiers or unique labels or tags uh, for certain data sets so we can easily access them, combine them, and manipulate that data. There are, of course, a lot of laws and regulations that govern the use of data. Uh, especially here in the United States, and here's uh, just a few of them. The General Data Protection Regulation, of course, the Federal Tr uh, Trade Commission, Children's Online Privacy Act, uh, HIPAA, which is commonly used in healthcare, the Health Insurance Portability and Counting Act, Graham-Leach uh, Act, 
and of course the Fair Credit Reporting Act, just to name a few. There are a lot of other laws and regulations around data, especially now during the age of artificial intelligence. And we see uh, progression of acts through Congress moving forward based on uh, the, the use and, and storage of data. There are three broad principles of data usage. The first, of course, is to follow the rule of law and understand what those laws are and have a minimum uh, bar for accountability. The second is the greatest priority must be the, to respect individuals behind the data. In other words, it's very important that we need to, uh, that the company has a high standard of ethics uh, in place to safeguard their, cus their customer, vendor, and other uh, external and internal parties to protect their data at all costs. And of course, the third is to utilize privacy and security safeguards that match privacy and security expectations of that data. For example, two-factor authentication, uh, fingerprint readers, facial recognition, et cetera. Those are all methods of security to safeguard data. What does it mean to clean data? When we have large data sets, it's important to be able to remove dupl duplicate entries, to be able to <clears throat> merge certain data pieces together, to make it in, uh, more refined and displayed in a more meaningful way. So that's what it means to clean data. So there's a very simple process so when it comes to cleaning data and we call this the rinse, wash, scrub and repeat <laughs> process. And it, it, you think of a laundry uh, machine that rinses and then washes and then scrubs and then dries and then repeats, right? Uh, and and so the, the idea behind this is that we're removing errors. We are uh, removing duplicate entries uh, and we are uh, doing a deep study of information uh, to eliminate any errors that may have occurred in the data. So there's four categories of data analytics uh, that are used in problem solving. <clears throat> and these are uh, relatively arranged by complexity and correspond with the values that are needed by the users of that data. <clears throat> Pardon me. Each of these techniques, of course, are varied based on the level of difficulty. The difficulty level and the value of the data being generated, uh, of course, is prescribed by the organization and what they can use that data for in the future. So really there's four types of, of data analytics. <clears throat> there's descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. So descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Uh, and so that this graphic kind of represents uh, the four data types as being past and future. And so we're, we're going to explore these, these four data types. First, of course, is the descriptive. Descriptive analytics describes what has already happened in the past and uh, or what's happening right now in, in the present. And that information uh, is important because it describes patterns within the organization. And of course, those patterns can be used to analyze uh, previous decisions in order to help the process of understanding future decisions. So the process for descriptive analytics is to take the raw data, sort that data, arrange it, and present it in a visual setting. 
data visualization involves <clears throat> a broad category within descriptive techniques. We, we visualize data using charts, graphs, and dashboards. The dashboards uh, is currently the most popular means of gathering and presenting data in a visual setting. Data analytics helps with that process by using things like gauges, dials, pie charts, uh, and other simple numbers to identify like time, temperature, or, or other cumulative uh, visitors to a website. And here's a great uh, example of such information in a visual setting. So we, here we have a, a bar chart, a pie chart, and a time series graph. These are very easily created in Excel uh, or Power BI. Uh, and of course, they, they help you to really visualize the data in a meaningful way. The second uh, type of data is called diagnostics. Diagnostics, of course, uh, just like the name sounds, it helps us to diagnose certain issues. Uh, the, so the diagnostics comes from identifying the patterns, which helps us to focus on the why question. So why did this happen? Why did the price go up? Why did the uh, region uh, change? Why uh, did this experience occur for this customer? It helps us to answer those types of questions. So we look at the diagnostics as to tracing the why something happened. Yeah. Some of the techniques we used in diag diagnostic analysis is to explain what happened, right? So we ask the question why to answer the what. Uh, so we look at the anomalies in data using descriptive uh, analytics. It helps us to identify statistical methods uh, and additional data visualizations. We could look at information by region, warehouse, office, or even at the product level to help us to explain what happened. And so we can drill down on each level of the, inf of the data to help the decision makers understand what happened, and then of course, to be able to make future decisions. Predictive analytics, which is the third subset of analysis, helps us to use the historical data to predict future outcomes. For example, a company might look at uh, customer history to understand if a cost what, what the probability of a customer uh, making a warranty claim on a product. So a couple of examples here uh, to look at using predictive analytics. What is the expected production volume for next year based off of historical data? What is the uh, employee bonus effect on sales and compensation? using historical data. How much would our income increase if we reduced unfavorable uh, variances like labor by 10%? What would be the impact? Of course, looking at historical data and market uncertainties that could occur. Uh, what's the probability of that happening and there being an impact on our distribution uh, channel? All of those questions could be answered by looking at historical data and analyzing information to make predictive conclusions. So what are the challenges and constraints of using this, this type of data? Well, the quality is not always the best, but it's there. Uh, the degree of uncertainty around the situation, the, it's difficult to obviously predict the future in, in a certain way. So there's always that degree of uncertainty. The statistical training needed in order to understand how pre uh, predictive data works uh, it is uh, somewhat challenging, but it's definitely needed to understand it. Predictive data, there's always a potential uh, biases that might be included in the data and could result in errors. 
And of course, communicating those results to decision makers can always be a challenge. So when using predictive techniques, uh, there are a couple of rules that, that, that should be followed. The first is the association rule, where data mining techniques look for the cause and effect relationships. Using regression analysis for the historical data helps us to evaluate the relationship between one or more independent variables and the dependent variables, of course. And the last, uh, the, the fourth technique of data analytics is prescriptive analytics, which, uh, as the name implies, provides recommendations uh, based off of the data, uh, based off of assessment of the information. Prescriptive analytics uh, has potential, of course, to generate high value for the users based off of the information that, is that they're seeing. And it helps the decision makers to ultimately make uh, decisions based off the desired future state of the company. Uh, prescriptive analytics is very impactful, but still relatively difficult to conduct because uh, oftentimes there isn't enough data in order for there to, to be an authoritative recommendation uh, for future decision-making. So looking at a couple of common approaches with the prescriptive techniques, of course, we use machine learning in order to uh, make uh, better predictions for the future uh, uh, techniques. Simulations are a wonderful way to under, better understand probability, the what-if uh, scenario, uh, or sensitivity analysis, another excellent technique to be able to predict uh, what might happen in the future. Of course, probability uh, using statistical analysis uh, is still truly one of the best techniques to use, especially when it comes to per, uh, prescriptive um, and other future techniques. So in cost accounting, it's important to understand uh, data analytics because in cost accounting, we utilize the information to better understand what the value is being added to the business. So we try to eliminate non-value added activities in order to maintain uh, that all of the business processes and procedures are adding value to the business. Helps us to control our supply chain uh, in more meaningful ways by looking at things like on-time performance of our suppliers. Performance evaluation for our employees by looking at information like the times that they're clocking in and out, uh, the, the uh, overall performance of those employees helps to drive... Uh, uh, improve production in the future. And of course, the data analytics helps the cost accountants to drive strategy uh, into the future. So what are the types of skills that you should know? Uh, the first, of course, is understanding your business and the accounting skills that are needed for your work. You should always be thinking somewhat outside of the box in order to help to raise that critical th uh, thinking skill and also to, of course, look for potential in solving business problems. Effectively communicate to all of your stakeholders, both internal and external. Get comfortable with the possibility of failure and develop technical skills and analyzing data. Uh, and so what I would encourage you to do is to really learn how to use things like Excel and Power BI, because those two tools will be used on the job as an accountant. I promise that you will be analyzing data at some point in your career as an accountant. Being able to communicate 
data in a meaningful way is extremely important, especially for non-technical users. Typ the typical CEO of, a of an organization typically doesn't have the technical wherewithal to understand how to analyze big data. That's one of the jobs of an accountant. And so being able to tell the story in a meaningful way is extremely important. And the best way that we can do that is to help the end user to visualize the information. And we can do that using graphs and dashboards. Uh, those are our best tools that we have available to us as accountants to help other users to understand the information that they're seeing. And so uh, being able to tell the story through the lens of the graphs and, and that type of data, I think is extremely important because uh, the end users really need to be able to make decisions. And sometimes they need to make those decisions relatively quickly. So being able to look at a graph uh, or look at a dashboard and being able to manipulate the data through that, I, I think is extremely uh, useful for the decision makers. So I'm gonna show you an example of, of a company uh, using a dashboard, a dashboard was created uh, using Power BI, and, and this dashboard shows uh, future investors a very quick, understandable visual for the investors in order for them to be able to make decisions in the, in the upcoming year. So here we have uh, a trend analysis using a simple uh, line graph. The, with various data points showing the budgeted versus actual performance with respect to revenue. We can see uh, total revenue, gross profit, and operating income here displayed across the top, a uh, number of unit sales to date, and then of course a breakdown of the cost per unit. So this type of data, being able to see this in a dashboard setting uh, can help an investor in a very visual way in order for them to be able to make decisions in a relatively quick manner of uh, just by looking at this type of information uh, in a visual way helps me to break down uh, it and be able to make a decision without having to dive into the raw data in the Excel workbook. So uh, I would strongly encourage all of you to use this type of information to help you to communicate the data in a logical way to your internal and external stakeholders. And with that, uh, these are the learning objectives that we just covered. And if you have any comments, questions, or concerns as you continue to explore data analytics, please reach out to me. You can email me, call me, set up office hours. I am here for your support. So thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate all of you. Have a wonderful day.